my uh, presentation will mostly focus on house and household archaeology uh, in Egypt in late antiquity, so I'm kind of an outlayer, but late antiquity is my predecessor to Middle Ages. Um, and there's going to be much focus on uh, textual against the material evidence for um, that period. And um, I will be discussing the case study house that was actually the subject of my PhD thesis and uh, finish with some considerations. So uh, Egypt in late antiquity, well, the starting date is actually challenging to define it. And it um, uh, actually uh, relates to what David was saying before about um, not, not being able to categorize uh, the time frames for specific geographical areas and cultures. Um, some say that it may have started in the late first century under Diocletian's uh, reign. Uh, others say it was under Constantine's reign and the foundation of Constantinople, uh, while others contest that it may have been uh, towards the fifth century with the uh, division into eastern and uh, western halves of the uh, empire. Um, uh, there is a consensus that the period spans at least until the Arab conquest of Egypt in 641 CE, though there's also more discussions on the contemplation of the existence of a long late antiquity that lasts even up to the 8th, 9th century CE, uh, also related to long-term dynamics and historical continuum. In general, the study of late antiquity is tightly linked to the study of transition from antiquity to the Middle Ages and the study of Christianity. Uh, concerning Egypt, there's much interest uh, in um, monastic archaeology and the a transition from paganism to Christianity. So it's definitely a period of change and transition. Um, previously, it had often been a uh, uh, synonym of crisis and decline, but with recent years, it has been uh, um, acknowledged that it's a period with its own, uh, with its own characterization or own personality and should not just be seen as a transitional phase. So, of course, when we talk about Egypt, we can we think about um, papyri uh, being a, a, there being an abundance of papyrological finds, uh, so which made Egypt actually a unique source of information on everyday aspects of human life taking place in towns and villages, because a lot of those papyri were actually found from uh, settlements. And it's um, undoubtful that papyri can yield details that, on daily life that can hardly be inferred from other archaeological data. For instance, we have legal documents, we have on private property, on house sales, rental agreements and prices, administrative accounts, tax registers, okay. contracts of a variety of uh, sorts, receipts, uh, private correspondence, accounts, memoranda, even Vibner invitations, as can be seen up there. Um, and the study of papyri allows to understanding household compositions and details of its members, even up to their names and ages, their socioeconomic situations, ethnic mm -hmm. backgrounds, descriptions and costs of their daily activities, and even about their houses, their house architecture and configuration uses decoration. But all this wealth of information and um, um, positivity has also its uh, downsides because uh, there's so much uh, attention has been put on the textual evidence, but it has kind of in some way obscured the, the uh, material archaeological one. Uh, but it is relevant to bear in mind that the kind of information retrieved from the papyri, as valuable as it may be, is quite different from that re retrieved from the archaeological data. And there's been appeals in um, the Egyptian archaeology community that the evidence should not be separated um, as they form part of the same context. And one of the reasons why the evidence has been separated is because, especially in the early excavations, uh, the objective was to retrieve papyri. So they were separated from their fine spots, but separated even uh, in, in terms of research. So there was no attempt, but at least at the time, no attempt to make a connection between the fine spot and the papyri uh, was made. In terms of um, uh, house and household archaeology, um, the over disadvantage is that for um, quite a long time, as some have still, some still consider papyri to be the primary source of houses. And it struck me to see um, in uh, the uh, book on housing in late antiquity by Lavan, well, edited by Lavan, Osgenel, and Sarantis, that Simon Ellis had commented that e the lack of Egypt did not figure at all in that book because much of the evidence from the province remains textual. And it is true that uh, one of the, um, well, the search for papyri was actually one of the leading research objectives when it came to the excavation of houses. And so the retrieval of the papyri uh, was a pri the primary objective and the archeological excavation of the context was secondary objective. And this, of course, has created a geographical bias because papyri are not preserved everywhere, uh, especially not in the humid environment of the Nile Delta 
which means that Benal Delta is um, either underrepresented or represented by data from other regions, which of course this leads to overgeneralization and assumptions. And this is where uh, my case study house um, comes into the, into the picture because it's um, it's from a site in the Western Nile Delta called Komalachmer uh, under the investigation of Padua University and the Italian uh, Egyptian uh, Italian Egyptian Archaeological Center, uh, and it is a settlement embedded uh, within the Delta countryside, surrounded by agricultural fields. So quite a different situation than that of other regions of Egypt, with of, with of course its own uh, preservation biases. Now the house um, is, uh, is of square plan. It's subdivided into three rooms and there's also space for a possible staircase that would have led to the upper stories. Um, nothing of the superstructure has been preserved. The, um, and the building was all entirely built in mud bricks um, aside for a uh, fire brick being used for some installations and uh, architectural additions. Uh, not even the access points were preserved, and as such, it was not even possible to generate um, uh, access diagrams. Um, however, what could be understood from the excavation is that the house was constructed sometime during the late 4th century and uh, early 5th century CE, and that it was occupied at least until the mid 5th century CE, and that it was inhabited by a, a non-elite household uh, who carried which was uh, concerned with carrying out um, small workshop activities in their, in their backyard, and uh, whose house um, served as a venue for a series of uh, uh, business transactions. So let's look at the archaeological evidence first from this area without pap papyrological uh, evidence. Um, so the late Roman residential sector of Komalachmer was orthogonally organized, uh, but uh, we know that um, the modifications applied to houses are a common phenomenon observed in late antiquity, not just in public buildings, even in uh, private ones. And uh, some of these uh, changes have been applied to the case study house, which I will show in the next slide. Uh, but it's um, pivotal to highlight that uh, the characteristics of a medieval Islamic uh, town, at least in Egypt, were compact, high density, um, presence of vernacular architecture. They had narrow streets and alleys, uh, no longer following the orthogonal layout, and closure of spaces to avoid sun and winds. So we, in this case, we are seeing local small-scale changes that may reflect growing and different trends in using and tailoring space from the, compared to the orthogonal one. So we see the square plan of the house as it, as it had originally been intended and built. And at a certain point, the, the household added some architectural additions to the south of the house with the creation of small rooms and spaces and the addition of steps, probably in relation to their everyday activities and um, necessities for sustenance. But uh, it wasn't the only ad addition that they did. At a certain point, the southern addition was forsaken and a different one was constructed to the eastern side of the house. And we see a different kind of uh, construction here in terms of like, it does, it's no longer a series of small rooms, but it is um, wall, uh, larger walls enclosing larger spaces. So we see also a difference in the way in which the household was perceiving uh, the outside space. Um, usually courtyards were shared among different houses. So um, we see maybe that they had a legitimate um, um, possibility of appropriating that space, or maybe, uh, or maybe they did it not so legitimately. Maybe they were sharing it with the neighbors, or maybe it was just uh, their own. But in any case, we see a different, different trend occurring. And this, the, the, walls in, in, the walls were also, uh, they didn't have foundations, so it wouldn't have been an enlargement of the house, but rather an addition of uh, a space that wouldn't have gone beyond the ground floor. And in this courtyard, that's where um, as, uh, the small-scale work, workshop activities were detected. Uh, the remains of glass, uh, of glass finds, glass furnaces, uh, and the remains of worked bone waste uh, allowed us to understand that uh, there was a worked bone and glass workshop activities being carried out. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, being um, a residential sector, the workshop would have been domestic and was, uh, wouldn't have the same performance and scale of an industrial workshop. But it fits with the economy of late antiquity, um, with artisanal activity and profit-oriented business being carried out in all urban centers, as opposed to the consumer city versus producer city concept. And it's actually um, 
a feature of the Islamic city, the separation between residential and production structures. So we see that changes are occurring, but um, at, at, at a different, di different changes are occurring at a different pace. I mentioned before that business transactions were being carried out in the premises of the, of the house and in the area in general. Um, over a thousand bronze coins were retrieved from the excavation unit between 2014 and 2019. And thanks to the 2D and 3D models, uh, we could understand that it was not at one time scattered, but rather a gradual dispersal. Um, so there was evidently frequent occurrence of transactions beyond household domestic economy. So is it viable to think that the commercial activities were being carried out? Um, it, it could be, yes, because domestic function does not ex exclude the commercial one. And as such, um, the use of a house's ground floor uh, as a venue for commercial transactions uh, could have been related to the household's purchases, but also businesses perhaps in relation with the workshop activities carried out in the backyard. The study of the numismatic finds, at least the legible ones, allowed to see that they originated from a variety of different mints, uh, from the Eastern Empire and also the Western Empire mints, as well as the local mint of Alexandria. And this gives insight on the penetration of uh, coin circulation into the countryside through the Mediterranean trade network. And, uh, shows how the involvement of, of that the countryside sites, such as Komelachmer, which was located in Alexandria's hinterland, what, what their involvement was in the movement of coins and goods, to, goods during that period uh, within e Egypt, but also beyond Egypt. Uh, and the numismatic uh, evidence fits with the evidence offered by the pottery as well, which shows uh, a, a trend towards um, east, eastern uh, imports from the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and I would also like to mention uh, the absence of, uh, of artifacts uh, as evidence. Uh, in the case study house, we, we, we could not uh, find um, any uh, trace of uh, textile tools, such as long weights and spindle whorls, um, and of course textiles, but textiles is understandable due to the uh, preservation bias. Um, but we know from both archaeological and papyrological evidence that textile production and maintenance was regarded as very widespread in the Romano-Egyptian house. But there was also a developed textile industry based in the cities. As such, this absence, although I'm aware that it may be related also to uh, not just the preservation issue, but also the abandonment uh, factor of people removing objects that they could have reutilized later on once abandoning a building. Still, this absence may denote that textile production may not have been carried out in all houses as part of a customary household activity. So it's, um, it's something to think about when nuancing our understanding. And moving to the cultic and religious evidence, uh, all the finds associable with religious practice related to paganism, even though late antiquity is deeply linked with the spread of Christianity. And of course, this brings us to think ab um, about the Christianization of Egypt being um, characterized by multiple simultaneous processes correlating with local traditions. So we might be seeing uh, evidence for syncretism with the continuation of local practices amid the Christianization, um, and which could mean that some local cults may have, local traditional cults may have declined while others may have been Christianized. It might, perhaps might not be surprising related to the, um, uh, to, to the characterization of late antiquity being a period of change and transition. Again, I'm also, I'm also aware that this might depend on the uh, preservation and abandonment factors uh, correlating to the abandonment of the building, but it was, in, it was interesting to note that no finds uh, related to Christianity were retrieved in that uh, context. And to wrap this up, um, I'm aware of the limits that a uh, case study approach can have because, of course, I do not intend to say that uh, one case study house is representative of a whole category, not at all. But, but the advantage of this is that um, it leads us to uh, such a deep understanding of the context that we can really grasp the, nuan the nuances of it. And in this case, we see the development of a residential urban sector throughout time. Uh, the appropriation of communal spaces between the houses. So we have traces of individual agency against the predefined model um, and also the socioeconomic situation of that particular household and how they were um, uh, providing for themselves, especially in an economy that was um, uh, greatly based on agricultural production. 
And in general, we see the adaptation to changing times in late antiquity. Uh, in this specific case, we also see how we can bypass the geographical bias set by Papari and also consider questions and data that are different from those that are triggered by the text. Thank you very much for your attention.